But that isn't all that the Ninth Amendment had reserved to the people of the states. Even if the 14th Amendment says no longer can you engage in slavery states, no longer can you abridge freedom of speech or freedom of religion, um, true, those particular matters are now removed from state control. But everything not addressed by the 14th Amendment remains under the control of the states as a matter of right. Tort law, real estate, contract, right? where to park your horse, okay? educational policy, and I would argue med medical policy as well. A, a raft of issues that had nothing to do with the 14th Amendment continue to be reserved to local majoritarian control as a matter of right. So now we would have to have a discussion over how much was changed by the 14th Amendment. All I'm saying is not everything was changed by the 14th Amendment. The 9th and 10th continue to preserve local autonomy over those areas not taken off the board by the, by the 14th. And I think the 14th, and this is part of what I'm working on. I'm working on privileges or immunities under the 14th Amendment. Georgetown Law Journal has just published a couple of my, a couple of my pieces um, uh, um, having to do with the proper interpretation of the 14th Amendment. Um, I'm certainly in favor of reading the 14th Amendment to incorporate the Bill of Rights, but I don't think it goes much further, uh, much further than that. But are you suggesting the 9th Amendment gives state legislatures rights that the 10th Amendment doesn't? It works together. Um, it works together, because notice what the 10th Amendment does. I actually think that Darby's correct. Darby's a case that you might have, again, might have discussed in con law that says the 10th Amendment is just a truism. It's really true. The 10th Amendment just says, when the federal government is done eating, you get what's ever left. That's all it is. That's all. Now, you can, you can talk about how, but it suggests, it suggests, yeah, yeah, yeah. But its text just says, if not delegated, okay, you get it. But guess what? Everything's delegated, right? You know, it's the Ninth Amendment. It's the Ninth Amendment that says, by the way, um, those powers which have been delegated to the federal government, they are not unlimited. Not only are they limited by the specific provisions of the Bill of Rights, there are additional limits to those powers which have been given to you, um, uh, uh, federal government. Um, and so therefore, um, the Tenth Amendment said an important thing, powers not delegated are reserved to the states. The Ninth Amendment then plays the critical role of saying, and here's, um, uh, here's a principle ensuring that you give a limited construction to those powers which are delegated so that there's actually something which is left to state control. So that's how the two work together. And that's what Madison is talking about in his speech. He said, Ninth guards against a latitude of interpretation and the tenth says everything not interpreted to be in their hands is reserved reserved to the state. So I would say that I would say that they work together. Yeah. Let's talk about medicine. I want to get your sense of medicine, healthcare, the, the healthcare debate, because I think you know the ninth and tenth amendments are probably going to be implicated in some of those arguments. Uh, you know, there's the individual mandate and also you know, obligations on the states. You just talk about what your sense is of. Know, where those cases might be going, what arguments are winners and losers with this current court? Here, when I, you know, I've given this talk, you know, the, the, um, Oxford Press did the book in, uh, you know, a couple of years ago. I guess a year and a half ago is when it first came out. And, um, and I've been invited to different places to talk about it, and I'd always warn the students. I still warn the students, you know, don't put any of this on the bar. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Griswold, just, uh, just go with Griswold, you know, for a little while longer. Um, and it was kind of a, you know, a, a, a self-deprecating um, um, admission on my part that what I'm talking about here is so different from the popular understanding of the Ninth and Tenth Amendments that it's unlikely to be picked up by, uh, by the modern court anytime soon. Right? Um, so I was kind of a lonely voice in the wilderness saying, come on, there's a lot of evidence back here that we should at least take a look at. The Ninth and Tenth Amendments don't bang up against each other. They're supposed to work together. But it was, I was kind of a lonely voice in that regard. Well, along comes, you know, rather, um, you get a party in power that believes in a vigorous um, um, exercise of federal authority in order to advance the public good. You're going to get a whole bunch of laws um, uh, pressing the limits, pressing the limits, taking it as far as it can go for the public good, for the benefit of the public good. That seems to have happened in the healthcare debate. Um, a very complicated piece of legislation that includes one particular provision, which is particularly controversial. 
Um, the individual mandate, which requires everyone, and there, there's certain income uh, requirements, but generally requiring individuals to purchase health insurance. An argument has been put on the table that that's just, you know, a bridge too far. Um, that the federal government doesn't have that much, that much authority. It's likely to generate a new case before the Supreme Court having to do with the proper construction of federal power. And there are two cases of, um, there are two uh, court cases currently working their way up. One is in Virginia, um, the other is a collection of state attorneys general um, uh, under the, the auspices of Florida and the Florida state attorney general. And in the briefs um, that the attorneys general are putting forward in the Florida, the Florida litigation, they're arguing that this um, health care mandate is in violation of the Ninth and Tenth Amendments properly interpreted. It's the first time I've seen in a brief at this level a Federalist reading of the Ninth and Tenth Amendments. So the one thing that is new is that this reading is now literally on the table and it's going to get serious judicial, um, judicial attention. How likely is it to win the day? Right? Will the court revamp its understanding of the Ninth Amendment? Um, will, it, will it strike down the health care bill? You know, or provisions of the health care bill? Very different. Um, political scientists would say highly unlikely. Um, if the health care bill is a very popular piece of legislation, on the other hand, if it's a very unpopular piece of legislation, the political scientists would tell us maybe there's a little bit more room for the Supreme Court to invoke, uh, invoke principles of federalism. I think it's poised on the edge of a knife. I think there are probably four votes very suspicious of this assertion of power and four votes of, uh, clearly in favor of this assertion of federal power. Um, and I'm not sure that it's Kennedy who's the undecided. This time. I really think that it's Justice Roberts. We talked a little bit at lunch uh, about this. I really think it's Justice Roberts who may end up voting in favor of the health care uh, healthcare provision. Um, but I think that it's a, uh, it's a close call. It's a close call. Um, and you are soon going to see um, a new interpretation of federal power that's going to make its way to the bar. And I've got my fingers crossed. Why are my fingers crossed? And I'll, I'll, I'll still continue to talk with people. I'll, I'll, close, I'll close on this. My fingers are crossed because I'm not only doing historical work, I'm also committed on as a normative matter to the attractiveness of this idea, um, this idea of dispersed power, the better to secure liberty, right? where power wouldn't be in the hands of any one institution, whether in the individual or in the federal government or in the state government. Um, better to have, um, better to have power bumping up against power um, all of them competing for the favor of the people. At the end of the day, I think that Madison uh, was right. Um, and I appreciate you giving me the chance to talk about it. So thank you. I just want to thank everybody for coming. I know we had a lot of events.